Growing up, I wanted to be an architect. Not the boring, real-life sort, but the fun, imaginary kind that did nothing but draw up designs full of bathtubs and dinette sets. I even had those green plastic quarter-inch scale drafting templates for furniture and fixtures. I didn't want to have to deal with clients or use serious engineering skills to figure out roof pitches and electrical wiring. Hi, I'm Irene, and I never fulfilled my Mike Brady dreams. That's right, I didn't become an architect. Ninth grade drafting classes put an end to that fantasy. Oh, (laughs) now I've got to play catch-up to explain what you just saw. Basically, I used my LED light pad to trace my original design onto watercolor paper. This particular paper is Strathmore's 500 series, 100% cotton cold press. It's my first time trying it out. I was going to pull out my drawer of watercolors, but for some reason, the idea of picking out colors was just a bit too daunting for me that day. So I chose one of my favorite compact palettes. The Derwent Graphitant Pan Set. I've used it for a number of projects, so I knew I'd have fun with it. And best of all, I wouldn't have to make too many tough color choices. It comes with a water brush, but I decided to use several of my Princeton brushes instead. The one you see me using first is the Size 10 Aqua Elite Round. Eventually, I switched to the quarter-inch stroke from the same series, and I ended up using the size 2 snap round last for the more detailed work. I understand an overhead drawing like this can be difficult for some people to decipher, so I'm going to explain the features and some of the thought process behind the layout. Logically, it would make sense to start at the entry point, but I'm mixing things up by beginning at the opposite end. On the left is the sleeping area. It has two windows with nightstands below them. Now, I've shown them as built-ins, indicated by the absence of a gap between them and the wall, but freestanding nightstands could work instead. They are 18 inches deep and 30 inches wide. A couple of drawers in each would provide welcome storage space, because that's something you can never get enough of. Beneath the bed is where you can place extra linens and bedding in either bins or drawers. That's a California king-size bed, by the way, with both a headboard and a footboard. Each of the two closed closets runs the width of the room, which is eight feet. There's framed art on the walls and a cushy rug on each side of the bed. Because I don't care for bare walls or cold toes in the morning. I also don't care for swinging open a door every eight feet, so there are minimal doors in this house. Really, the only one is the front door. Would that meet building codes? No idea. But with the size we're dealing with, one point of entry should be sufficient. You can always climb out a window if necessary. The flooring could be anything. Carpet, wood, tile, etc. But I imagine bamboo in the sleeping and lounging areas. Just a note concerning privacy, while there are no doors separating sleeping from lounging, I would hang curtains that can be easily opened or closed as needed. And, of course, pocket doors are an option. By the way, the line work was done beforehand using a Faber-Castell pit fine liner in black and a Winsor & Newton fine liner in sepia. That last was used to delineate the floorboards and tiles. 
They'll both appear near the end of the video when I add emphasis to those lines. The central part of the house is a multifunction space. Lounging, TV watching, eating, and working. The main piece of furniture is a seven-foot-long couch. Hopefully very comfy and preferably with washable slipcovers. Right behind that is a counter where you can place beverages and snacks. Of course, you could put those things on a nice coffee table in front of the couch, then set your gnarly feet next to them like a beast. But for maneuverability's sake, I omitted both coffee and end tables. However, proper relaxation means putting your feet up. That's why there are a couple of ottomans. Cushy enough for feet, firm enough for trays. Just another option for food and drink in case you can't quite manage to reach the counter behind you. In that case, the counter could be used as a display shelf for a vase, a fishbowl, or a creepy doll collection. By the way, the space below the counter can be more storage, perhaps in the form of baskets or those sturdy plastic storage bins. Off-season items like holiday decor can be kept there. Just pull out the couch a few feet to access it. That couch faces a wall-mounted TV. Below it are more built-in shelves. The Nintendo Switch, aka the Animal Crossing machine, has to live somewhere. But I picture only two tiers of shelves, since I want the ability to tuck the ottomans underneath, making room for a game of naked twister, or regular twister, whatever floats your boat. The TV would be placed at a level easily viewable from both the couch and the kitchen prep counter. But more about the kitchen later, there's still so much to talk about in this here lounge. You've likely noticed the two tables under the windows at the front and back. Or is it top and bottom? At six and a half feet long and two feet deep, you can easily accommodate two chairs. I guess they'd be considered counters rather than tables, especially since they're affixed. Although they look identical, they actually serve different purposes. The top table is for eating, while the bottom table is for working. They're drawn as built-ins, but freestanding pieces would give more flexibility. For the eating table, I would keep a napkin holder, a silverware caddy, and salt and pepper shakers there at all times, ready for meals. For the working table, we'd keep our computers or laptops there and use it as an office slash home management space. Each of the tables are flanked by shelving, 18 inches deep and 36 inches wide, from floor to ceiling, for books, collectibles, and general knickknacks. Perhaps glass-fronted to cut down on dusting duty. Although I didn't draw them in, window treatments such as blinds or curtains would, of course, cover all of the windows. While I chose the Graphitint palette for no-fuss painting, I actually did a lot of color mixing for this piece. There were only a few spots where I used an unmixed color. The first layers looked pretty pale, but I built up the colors with more layers to come. Not too much, though. I mean, there comes a point where the law of diminishing returns comes in. Sometimes that point can be hard to catch. But, spoiler, I believe things worked out very well in the end, with no overworked areas. You might be thinking, but Irene, where would the art happen? And that's a good question. Producer Mike and I both have interests that require a tad more space. So my answer is outbuildings. An art studio for me and a workshop slash man cave for him. 
Of course, if one has enough property to build multiple buildings, why not just make the house bigger to begin with? But let's not allow reason to interfere with a creative exercise. I've been interested in tiny and compact houses for decades, pre-internet even. It was part of my general interest in architecture, building, and home decorating. My local library had books full of photos, diagrams, and floor plans for homes of all sizes. And to me, the 800-square-foot ones were as fascinating as the 8,000-square-foot ones. Sure, those thick, hardbound volumes were a bitch to carry home. I quickly learned to evenly distribute them into two tote bags, one for each hand. I credit my lack of a severe hunchback to that practice. A slight hunchback is totally normal, right? Let's transition to the cooking area, which is mostly open to the lounge. I'm not a fan of open concept design. I like my cozy nooks. But even I realize, with a house this small, there is such a thing as too many walls, which is why there's a mere half wall between the kitchen's prep counter and the lounge. That means I could still enjoy travel tube while fixing dinner. Alternatively, you could place the sink or the range there, if that's how you roll. Transition strips cover the lines where bamboo meets tile. Lengthening the house would make it possible to add two feet of counter space on both the sink side and the opposite fridge side. Also, the wall sections flanking the range center could be eliminated to gain another six inches at each end. Do you like the cutting board details? Not sure if that's carrots or onions or simply potatoes. Uh, that reminds me. I have some things to say about potatoes. The other night, while taking advantage of Safeway's Cheap Chicken Monday, we had a hard time choosing between potato salad and potato wedges, mostly because neither option appealed to me. Most supermarket potato salads are either German or American style. That means they're highly vinegared with big chunks of potato. Those are styles that I used to enjoy, but I've since found something I like even more. And thick wedges of fried potatoes have never been a favorite. So what sort of potato salad do I prefer now? Japanese potato salad. It's made with thinly sliced and chopped ham, chopped medium boiled eggs, onion, carrot, cucumber, Kewpie brand mayonnaise, and only a spoonful of rice vinegar. Technique plays a big part. The thinly sliced onion, carrot, and cucumber are lightly salted and squeezed to rid them of excess liquid that would otherwise dilute the dish's flavors. And the boiled potatoes are partially smashed, leaving some small chunks for texture. Between distilled white and rice vinegars, there are notable differences, such as levels of acidity and sweetness. And the Japanese Kewpie mayo is made with only the yolks of eggs, not the whites. So using the right types of ingredients also makes a difference. Unfortunately, Japanese potato salad is not a grab-and-go option here, since most Americans don't even know about it. That means if I can't make it to an Asian market, I have to prepare it myself. Yeah, potatoes have been on my mind a lot lately because I've been reminded that if you're ever in France, be very careful when ordering a sweet apple tart because their word for apple is pomme, which is what they also use for potato. 
well, technically, potato is pomme de terre, meaning apple of the earth. But in my mind, the potential for confusion and resultant embarrassment is huge. Yes, I've been watching videos about how to order at a French restaurant. Not that I'm getting to France anytime soon. I have to settle for grabbing a croissant which at BK or a cronut at Happy Don'ts. But you never know. On the topic of food, I just watched Cowboy Kent Rollins cook up some birria tacos. They are usually beef or goat tacos dipped in broth, pan-fried, and served with consomme as a dipping sauce. They looked amazing. I recently tried birria tacos for the first time, and they were so tasty. A little messy, but still yum. Yeah, I've watched Cowboy Kent a few times, and every time I'm reminded of the movie Giant. I know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, since Kent is in Oklahoma, not Texas. But there it is. I've never been to Texas. The closest I've gotten was Las Vegas. Or was it Anaheim? Maybe it was Orlando. The stapes are shaped weird, so I'm not sure. Lest it sounds like I'm well-traveled, those are the only places I've been to outside of Washington and Oregon. That's right, I haven't been to British Columbia, which is practically backyard territory. It's on the bucket list, along with an Alaskan cruise. Hey, if I'm ever going to head that way, may as well hit Alaska, too. Speaking of Alaska, YouTube channel Pero DJ recently uploaded their Alaskan port guides. They're really fun to watch. Uh, back to tacos. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm all over the place today. But I need to talk about Jim Boy's Tacos. Five years ago, when producer Mike and I spent several days in Anaheim, California, we kept our eyes open for budget-friendly food options. Luckily for us, there was a McDonald's within a few blocks, but better yet, there was a Jim Boy's Tacos close to our hotel. So after spending all day and night at Disneyland, we hit it on the way back. It was late in the evening, and we were pretty hungry, so we ordered the six-pack of their signature item, the ground beef taco. Those corn tortillas were packed with meat, cheese, and lettuce, with a sprinkling of parmesan to boot. Normally, we can each put away four or five Taco Bell tacos easily, which is why we usually opt for their party pack. But Jim Boys were more filling. We couldn't finish the six-pack. But that's not a reflection of the quality, because they were quite tasty. In fact, five years later, producer Mike still reminisces over them. I understand that particular one is now closed, but there are other locations in Central California and even a couple in Texas. I wish we'd gone back, when we had the chance, to explore more menu items. Look, I'm not an expert on Mexican cuisine, but even I realize this is a very American version of tacos. It's still tasty, though, and probably more authentic than my Japanese mother's one-pot tacos. Back to the here and now. From the kitchen, you can access the bathroom. Well, there's no bathtub, only a shower, a toilet, and a sink. That's what's known as a three-quarters bath. This space would benefit from an extra foot or two of space. I don't recall if I already mentioned this. It feels like this video's been going on for years. But I was limited by the scale I chose and the paper's size. 
So just imagine another couple of feet to uncramp some of these spaces. Also through the kitchen is a combination foyer and utility room. The washer and dryer are side by side with storage cupboards above. But another option is to go with a stacking set or even an all-in-one unit. That would free up some space for a closet or a water heater or a furnace. On the opposite wall are hooks for hanging coats, a high shelf for rarely used items, and a low shelf for dropping mail and packages. Below that is space for shoes. And that ends the touring portion of this video. Of course, this isn't a buildable plan as is. It's just a painting after all. Practical changes would have to be made, such as adding space for a water heater and a furnace. Those are usually found in a closet, a utility room, or a basement. In the case of this plan, I would extend the foyer to accommodate those things. Walking through a laundry room and a kitchen to get to the rest of the home is not ideal, but with a mere 720 square feet to work with, compromises had to be made. The term tiny house is often used loosely because there are no set limitations. One person's tiny might be 300 square feet, Another's might be twice that, so I've settled on calling anything under 500 square feet tiny, while 500 to 1,000 square feet is what I call compact. So to my way of thinking, at 720 square feet, this plan is a compact house. How do I know how much square footage there is? Because I know the scale. The original drawing was on graph paper with an 8x8 eight eight grid, meaning there's 8 squares per inch, and I chose to scale this project at 1 inch equals 4 feet. So all I had to do was count squares and multiply. Hey, I was an A student in algebra. It was geometry that screwed me over. And that wasn't even my fault, really. But that's a story for another day. Now is not the time for bitter Irene. Yeah, I've looked into tiny houses, and in my opinion, they just aren't livable. Unless it's for a single person who's got minimalism down. And that's a very niche market. I do think this design could be livable with a couple of minor tweaks. I say livable, but I really mean only for one or two people. There's not much space for hobbies or entertaining, after all. So as a full-time residence for a couple, there would be challenges. However, if used as a getaway cabin or an accessory dwelling unit, ADU for short, it's actually rather roomy. I was limited by the size of paper I was using. Sure, I could have used a bigger piece, but I didn't want to have to zoom out too far to see the full plan. If I had my druthers, I'd add another three or four feet to the overall length making the total square footage closer to 800 square feet. So what did I think of this Strathmore 500 series 100% cotton cold-pressed watercolor paper? I didn't encounter any issues, and I am pleased with the results. That said, this project was pretty undemanding, so I think judgment should be withheld until I've used it for another painting or two. What else did I learn with this exercise? I've learned I can talk almost all day about house plans, for one thing. For another, I don't use this Derwent Graffitant pan set nearly enough. I really dig this palette. The colors are softly muted and have a subtle graphite sheen. 
If I wanted to throw a palette in my bag for some casual painting fun, this would likely be my first choice. There's actually an old floor plan series languishing in my video library. Seriously, next to the collage stuff, those might be my least viewed uploads. It's a Halloween haunted house that I called the House of Scares. It took up six large sheets of watercolor paper. That was a big project. This one is much more modest in comparison. I've mentioned before that my interest in house plans was sparked by my mom's handful of old house plan magazines. By old, I mean from the 1970s. Heck, some of them might have been from the 60s. But that interest grew to encompass architecture in general and also renovation. I used to watch the PBS program, This Old House, and when I finally got the cable channel HGTV, I watched shows like Design on a Dime, Divine Design, and even those house flipping shows. But eventually, I really lost interest in cable programming. For the past decade, my entertainment choices have mostly come from YouTube and streaming services. I have other small round brushes, including some from the Neptune series, but I wanted something a little firmer than those. This number two snap fit the bill. That's not my first time using that idiom, fit the bill. But didn't it sound odd just now? Perhaps that's because it's not used as much these days. Anyway, it bugged me so much that I snooped around the net and found it was mentioned in Paul Bryan's book, Common Errors in English Usage. Apparently, the phrase was originally fill the bill and referred to the practice in entertainment of adding short acts to supplement the main attraction, thus filling the bill. I'd never heard it that way before, so if nothing else, at least somebody learned something today. What was my point? Oh, I think I'm getting better at predicting which sorts of brushes I'll need. You all saw it. At the very beginning, I showed the three brushes I intended to use, and good gravy, that ended up being the case. No more, no less. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You don't have to stay within self-imposed limitations, but it can be an interesting exercise. And tossing in some challenges now and then is good for you. The other night, I watched the new Nate Bargatze Netflix special. I laughed so much, I was in tears and had to constantly wipe my eyes. Well, that caused them to become itchy and irritated. I had to use a bunch of soothing eye drops to calm them down. Nate, you owe me a bottle of Visine. No, I don't personally know the comedian, but I've listened to enough of his jokes that, in my mind, I've earned first-name basis status. That reminds me of the time producer Mike and I were at LAX waiting for our flight to SeaTac. I'd complained, as I do, about having dry, itchy eyes. Well, he disappeared for a few minutes and returned with a newly purchased bottle of Visine. I'm not saying my partner doesn't do nice things for me, because he does, frequently. But that act of care and consideration stuck with me. Almost as much as the cheeseburger and fries he got me from Shake Shack across the terminal. I don't know if I was just super hungry or what, but OMG, I remember that meal fondly. I may have been in a bustling airport surrounded by noise and chaos, but me and my shack burger were having a real moment. Not long ago, after discovering there was a Shake Shack in Seattle, we attempted to recreate the experience. It just wasn't the same. Because I'd ordered the wrong item. <laughs> 
next time we'll get it right. I'm happy to share this house painting experience. Thank goodness it wasn't the rollers and drop cloth sort of house painting. Coloring individual planks and tiles was tiring enough. Throw in the constant mental strain of what color should this be? And I'm absolutely knackered. Until next time, I've had it with your food obsession. Either seek help or start a foodie channel already. And stay artsy, my friends. Is anyone else being kept up at night by the Emperor's new groove because that's the only way their partner can fall asleep? Do you ever search for weird things on purpose just to shake things up in your recommendations list? By the way, I totally googled, is a slight hunchback normal? See, that's one of the reasons why the internet is so messed up. <laughs>